Good morning, Grace Community Church. His name truly is our life. Today we're going to be focusing on the bread of life. So let's join together and let's stand and sing. We have come to join in worship. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to Grace Community Church here in Surprise, Arizona. My name is Mary Mellinger, and I want to welcome each and every one of you here today. And let's turn around and wave at those visiting with us online. <laughs> now, if you're new to Grace Community, we'd like you to fill out the Keep in Touch cards that are located in the seat back in front of you, and also pick up a visitor gift bag out in the lobby area. Now, there's a lot of things going on this week, so you need to really mark your calendars for practically each and every day. Okay, so the first thing, on Thursday, April 18th, we're going to be showing the movie The Letter to the American Church by Eric Metaxas at 2.15, and everyone is welcome. On Friday, April 19th at 7 p.m., we're going to have Black River Jam concerts right here at the church. And uh, Cliff has said, invite 100 or so friends to come. Uh, I talked to Michelle, and it sounds like it's going to be really cool. I'm very interested to hear all the different inst instruments. And now, ladies, on Saturday, the TN Style Show is coming on April 20th. Mark your calendars for that. Sign up as well, because we have, ta I guess there's 17 tables already, so that's wonderful. And practice with your kinky posture, too. <laughs> Um, and finally, Sparkle Day is coming up. Uh, we want to put a shine on our church for the springtime on Wednesday, April 24th from 9 to noon, followed by a light lunch. So please shine, sign up in the Sheep Gate. Now please stand and greet one another in Jesus' name. Uh, please remain standing and join me in our call to worship.
I'll wait, Cliff. <laughs> we give thanks to you, O oh God. We give thanks to you. For your name is near. We recount your wondrous deeds. Let, let our, our souls, souls bless, bless the Lord. Lord and, and let, let all that, that is within, within us bless, bless his, his holy name. name. Yes, yes, let our souls bless, bless the Lord and forget not all of his benefits. We will praise the Lord for it is good. It is pleasant and praise befits the upright. Yes, it is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness at night. We, we will, will extol, extol you, our God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day we will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. We will pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and sing aloud of your righteousness. We will sing to the Lord a new song and his praise in the assembly of the godly. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the children of Zion rejoice in their king. Let the godly exalt in glory and let the high praises of God be in their hearts and in their throats. We will, we will bless, bless the Lord as long as we live. We, we will sing, sing praises to our God while we have our being. And when we have no being on earth, we hope to have a being in heaven to be doing it better. Let us worship God. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me.
continue. I'm Reverend Lanny Mellinger, and I'm related to the beautiful lady that did the announcements, Mary Mellinger. For about 42 years, we've been together. 
Let's come before the throne of God's grace. Let us pray. Gracious God, as we worship, our hearts overflow with gratitude. Thank you for your abundant grace, for the gift of salvation, and for the privilege of gathering in worshipful celebration. With thankful hearts, we celebrate your goodness and enduring love in our worship here today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to be the bread of life for the world. Forgive us for elevating earthly appetites above devotion to you. Feed us with the knowledge of Christ so that we recognize our sin and gladly repent in his name. We pray for those who daily need healthy food, clean water, proper shelter, and all those needs go unmet. And we pray for those misusing what they have in the vain pursuit of pleasure. Feed them with all the good things of Christ for life now and in eternity. Have mercy on those whose lives have been broken by violence and crime. Feed them with hope and a new life in Christ. And bless our brothers and sisters in prison and those who minister to them. Feed those who are sick or sorrowing with healing and consolation through Christ. We pray for Steve Pates, Charles Marshall, and all those that are in need of your healing touch. We pray for our military and first responders for their protection. We pray for our country leaders that you would give them your wisdom. We pray for the people of Israel for the release of hostages, for the cessation of violence, and for peace, your shalom in this world. Lord, meet the needs of others we know personally to be in want, and whom we now name silently in our hearts. Merciful Father, you heard the prayers of your people in the wilderness and you fed them with bread from heaven despite their sin. Graciously hear us today and feed us too with the bread of life from heaven, even our Lord Jesus Christ, for he lives and he reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And so, God of glory, no darkness of despair nor gloom of sin can eclipse the light of your love revealed in Jesus Christ. May we shine brightly in serving him and reflect something of your overwhelming love for the whole world in Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught his disciples how to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In Matthew 4, 4, we read, But Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. 
Therefore, hear the word of God as it is taken from the gospel according to John, the sixth chapter, verses 22 to 59. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him... God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all, nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son <coughs> and believes in him should have eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. So the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to, the, to me unless the father who sent me, draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day, as it is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. 
Well, the Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? But Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in him, in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What do you think, Lanny? Should I go verse by verse yes, today? Yes. All right, man. I'm going to the comfy chair today. You know, I, I thought that uh, Lanny's been out of the pulpit for way too long, and so I, I figured I'd give him a lengthy verse. Last week we had six verses. This year, this week we had 600 verses. Uh, but you know, the Word of God is, is very powerful. By the way, all this talk about food, it's making me hungry. And if you're kind of newer in the church and you really, you don't know me and I don't know you that well, you know, we're going to have some pizza at about 1130 in a room back in that far corner. And you are welcome to come and feast on pizza. Now, y'all who have been around for a while, uh-uh-uh, uh-uh-uh. <laughs> and snowbirds, don't forget to fill out those little yellow slips so that I know who's gone and who's, you know, because if we have to call the police and ask for like, a, you know, courtesy check, uh, and, and you're all actually up in Minnesota fishing, you know, that's a problem. So help us out and let us know when you're going to be in town when you're not. Well, we've been in the Gospel of John on this epic journey for, well, since Christmas, since just after Christmas. And we are steaming right along, and we're in John chapter 6 already. And John chapter 6 takes place right around the Passover. And Passover, if you don't know about that, I remember when the angel of death passed over people's houses. Maybe you remember that. Maybe you know something. Maybe you don't know anything about that at all. But God said, look, you know, you put the blood of the lambs, over the, the doorposts, and the angel of death will pass by you. And, uh, and, and um, so the whole story of the Passover was, is remembered every year in Jewish homes, and it is especially remembered uh, th things like uh, the people of God exiting Egypt and, uh, and crossing through the Red Sea. Most people have heard of that story where, where Moses, you know, is given, you know, he gives a directive, go through the, the Red Sea. Of course, the Lord is behind all this, and, and the waters part, and the people walk through on dry land, and it's an amazing miracle. And then they get into the desert, and they're wandering through the desert for 40 years, and the Lord feeds them on manna for, uh, for, for all this time, manna from heaven, manna, a kind of bread from heaven. And um, so it's a, it's a beautiful picture. But what we have here in this passage is the third of three pictures, uh, or four pictures actually, and we got a, the fourth one next, next week. Uh, and, and the first scene that we have is of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And uh, he's on the far side of the Sea of Galilee. They're out in the wilderness. The people are hungry. They start to grumble and mumble. And Jesus uh, takes a few loaves and fishes and, Wow. All of them are fed. There probably are more than 5,000, probably more like 20,000, because they don't mention women and children, and probably women and children were with them. And so Jesus multiplies this in front of them, feeds them. They have their fill. There's all kinds of leftovers. And, um, 
And then, you know, the people are all going, this guy's amazing. We need to make him king. They're going to make him king by force. And Jesus knows, knew what was in their hearts. And so he sent the disciples off in a boat, uh, go to Capernaum, and they go rowing off in a boat, and he goes and hides out on a mountain and prays. And uh, the disciples, of course, they, they get involved in this big, huge storm that blows up. And uh, the, they're rowing all night. They're going hard at the oars. And the wind and the waves are, are overtaking them. But just as they, they, they are, oh, you know, just ready to give up, they see Jesus coming across the water. He doesn't need to part the waters. He walks right, on, or right over top of them. That's pretty impressive. So... This is, the, this is the second scene that we have in this chapter. Um, so he's produced bread for a multitude. He's walked on water. And this morning, this lengthy passage that we read uh, is, is where Jesus preaches this very crisp, clear sermon on who he is, uh, the life that he offers, and how we can receive it. He puts it in terms that every single person in every age, every culture can understand it. So I hope that you have your Bible open today and that you'll follow carefully as we pick up on the story in verse 22 of chapter 6. This is the day after Jesus has multiplied the loaves and the fishes and fed this enormous crowd. And the crowd that was fed by the miracle of Jesus, they go back to the place where they've been fed because they want to see him again and oh they don't find him there and then they go across and and, and you know they, they know the disciples all left in this boat by themselves without Jesus and, and and therefore they conclude that Jesus must still be somewhere in the desert area anyway all of that aside they can't find Jesus and and, and when they can't fi- find him they they're figuring their best bet of, of finding him is to go and see uh, where the disciples are on the other side of, of the Sea of Galilee in Capernaum. Verse 23, other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they'd eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. All these boats, I mean, think about this. This is a lot of people. These were like water Ubers, you know, all coming across the water, you know, I don't know how many thousands of people piled into these boats, but it must have been quite a scene. And Jesus speaks to them uh, about the food that really matters when they, when they reach him. Verse 27, don't work for the food that perishes, but the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Jesus is following up with those, the, those who experience this miracle of, of eating the loaves and the fishes. Now, you understand gang, that uh, what you do every day in life is that you work in order to, to get the food that you need to sustain your life. You need clothing, you need shelter, you have to work for all of that, it wears out. And, but the first thing that you need to do is that you sustain your life with food. You work every day, day after day, and, you know, and that's especially in a culture where there are no refrigerators or freezers. Anybody here not have a refrigerator or freezer? We'll pray for you. No, but, you know, we all have them. So we don't, you know, it's not as hard as it once was. But in essence, what Jesus is saying is that your whole life boils down to this. You work to live. Now, I don't know too many of you who would be living here in this area without having worked your buns off at one point or another. I'm guessing that you did. Yes, your pastor just used the word buns, not in reference to bread. Okay. (laughs) You work for food, but here's your problem. Food by its very nature perishes. You either eat it and it's gone, or it spoils and it's gone. So you buy it, then you eat it, Then you go back and you buy it again and you eat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, over and over and over and over again. And the whole point being that Jesus had fed these people just the previous day. All these loaves and fishes, they had their fill. They had so much food. But here they are the next morning and they're hungry again. Can you believe it? So Jesus says, 
work for the food that endures to what? Eternal life. Jesus is saying, you have to understand there are two kinds of food here. There's a, there's a food that perishes that we, we need every day to sustain us, but it does only so much. It lasts only a short time. Then you need more. Some people say, yeah, pastor, we know you need more and more. And Well, we'll let's stay away from that subject right now. There's a, there's a food that perishes that we need every day to sustain us, but, but it's gone. In a, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. But there's a second kind of food that Jesus talks about. Food that endures to eternal life. Food that can sustain you forever. And Jesus says, look, make sure that whatever you spend your whole life working for, make sure that you get the food that endures to eternal life. Now, I want to make, I, 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 I make three very simple observations about this food that endures to eternal life. First, that Jesus gives it. Second, that Jesus is it. And thirdly, that you can have it. It can be yours. First, Jesus gives eternal life. Verse 27, don't work for the food that perishes, but the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man, reference to Jesus, which the Son of Man will give you. I mean, do you see the contrast between work and give? Don't you always like it when you go to a restaurant and pe somebody else picks up the tab? I mean, I'm always going, whoo, baby, I got these alligator arms going, you know. But it's always nice when somebody's picking up the tab for you. That's what's being said here. Our whole lives, we work to get the food that perishes, but Jesus says that he'll give the food that endures to eternal life. Pretty good deal, huh? Now, as soon as Jesus speaks about giving food, these people immediately think about the story of Moses in the Old Testament and how God brought, gave manna to the people and, and bread from heaven, and, and it descended every morning and fed the people of God and sustained them through 40 years. That's amazing. And, and then in verse 31, they say, they, it says, they say our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. What sign will you do that we may see and believe you? <laughs> Didn't Jesus just, I mean, is that not mind-blowing? Jesus just multiplied the loaves and the fishes for everybody who was out there in the wilderness, and they're like looking for another sign. It's extraordinary. But I, I, I think the point is that in their minds, Moses had done a much better miracle. You see, Jesus fed 5,000, whoop de doo da 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 but Moses, he fed 2 million for 40 years. So the point of the question is, look, Jesus, we've seen you doing some pretty remarkable things yesterday. That, that, was, that was pretty impressive, but you're surely not in a position to be greater than Moses. And Jesus has two responses here. First, it wasn't Moses who, who gave you the manna. It was God. Verse 32, truly, truly, I say to you, it wasn't Moses who gave you the manna, the bread from heaven. It was my father. Second, the manna in the wilderness was a miraculous provision of God. But verse 49, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. And guess what? Thank you. They died. So the manna in the wilderness was actually food that perishes. It sustained the fathers for only a short time, and then they were pushing up daisies. Do they have daisies over there? I don't know. Jesus is saying, look, I am offering you something that is greater than manna in the wilderness. Verse 50, this bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. That's what I'm offering. And that's the contrast he's making. Verse 58, whoever feeds on this bread will live for what? Forever. And maybe you noticed how often the Bible emphasizes that in this world, our lives will come to an end. Oh, I know it. You love it when I bring that up, don't you? But you see, when you're in your 20s or 30s, are you, are you thinking about that? You're May, you're not really interested in eternity as much as you're, you're thinking about getting help with 
you know, what you're faced with every day. I mean, why should I care so much about a mortal body when I'm looking at my body and going, ooh, this is a problem? Well, I mean, what good is the death of Jesus when I'm facing the loss of a job or, or whether or not I'm going to find a spouse? So when Jesus speaks about eternal life, it, it, it'll sound remote to many people, people who are totally consumed with what's happening in my life this week. But if we stand back from our immediate problems and we take a look at the big picture, what do we see? You work day after day for food that perishes. You eat the food, and then you die. Another hopeful thought from Pastor Cliff. <laughs> the, the only things that you can be 100% sure of are death and taxes. What's tomorrow, friends? <laughs> Tax day, April 15th, I know. Thanks a lot, Pastor Cliff, once again. And, and, and Jesus speaks here about the bread that comes down from heaven. So if anyone eats of it, you will live forever. But here's our problem. If to you, death is always someone else's problem, then Jesus will always be someone else's savior. Are you with me? So long before... <laughs> Well, before we long for a life that's imperishable, we must first accept that we are perishing along with everyone else we know and love. We've got to realize that anything we might accomplish or acquire in this world today is already fading away, isn't it? It is. Life, career, family, possessions, all our pickleball trophies? I mean, it's all passing away, friends. It's foolish to pretend it's an unavoidable reality. And when we see that, we begin to have an appetite for the life that's eternal. And you'll see that that's far more important than everything else that presses in on our hearts and minds. See, if you have eternal life, death for you is like just kind of slipping from one room to the next. I, to be away from the body is to be at home with the Lord. Amen? And, 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 and the life that is before us is better by far. I know people who are gripped by fear because of what they face in terms of death. Some of us have been gripped with fear. I understand that. But friends, we've got to think on a different level. Think of it this way. If you have eternal life, your experience in this world is the closest thing that you will ever know to hell. Because what lies ahead of you is only good and infinitely better. That is, if you have eternal life in Christ. Then whatever you're facing in this world is the worst it will ever be for you. It's as bad as, as it, it can possibly get. But if you don't have eternal life, then what you enjoy in this world is as close to heaven as you will ever get. And it's all slipping away. Because on the other side of death for you is a continued conscious existence that is not worthy of the name life. It's more like living death. And I have to say to you today, if you do not have eternal life, I feel sorry for you. Because your experience throughout life is always going to be that of slipping away. And you're always going to be living in fear since you have so little life and such a short life. You're always going to be in a panic because you're missing out on something. How can I cram in everything that's on my bucket list before I finally... Well, somebody say kick the bucket? That's appropriate, yeah. Yeah. But you see, if you have eternal life, if you, if you know that you have life in abundance and it will never end and it's infinite because God in Christ has given this kind of life to you, 
you'll have an entirely different experience. Even now. Because you, you, you'll see that being so rich in life, you can give your life away to others. You, you can give yourself away in service. You can have so... You, I mean... All of us who have experienced eternal life, I, mean, I got plenty, not worried about it. Am I worried about life here on earth? No, not really. I mean, I am, but um, only in the sense that I, I do it to the glory of God. But your life is unending in Christ, friends. I, and, and, and that's why it's so significant that Jesus Christ makes it clear that this Eternal life that he's speaking of starts now. It, we all think that, you know, eternal life starts when we're pushing up daisies. No. Eternal life starts when you accept Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior. That's, I mean, Jesus says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. One day you're going to you're going to have this life in the presence of the Father, friends. But already the presence of the Father has come to dwell in you through the person of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus opens up for us this most astonishing gift. He tells us that He gives eternal life. So let's move to the second observation. First, Jesus gives us eternal life. But then er, He gives eternal life. And then secondly... He is eternal life in and of himself. Notice what he says in verses 40, 35 and 48. Jesus repeats himself, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. And, and that's the first time he uses the I am's in explaining the kinds of things that he is. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. I am the what? Good shepherd, there are seven of these things that Jesus talks about in the Gospel of John. And he tells us two things that we need to know about him. He says that the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives his life to the world. Now that phrase, comes down from heaven, is used seven times in these verses. For example, in verse 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Verse 50, this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Verse 51, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Why in the world is this so important? Because comes down from heaven puts Jesus in an entirely different category from anyone else who's ever lived. No one else can say uh, uh, any of this. A little later in John's gospel, Jesus puts it this way. You are from, a, you are from below. I am from above. Hmm. And notice verse 41. The people grumbled because he said this. You see, Jesus is never popular. Have you ever noticed that? Jesus comes down from heaven, and that puts him in a category of his own, that God has come to us. In Jesus Christ, the Word became flesh and lived among us, John 1. That's the first thing that we need to see and know about Jesus. Secondly, in the same verse, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives his life to the world. Now, Jesus says, look, this is what I've come to do. I took on human flesh. I came down from heaven in order to give life to the world. How? Verse 51. By giving his life to the world. The bread that I give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, we all understand that in order to eat bread, it needs to be broken. Jesus comes down from heaven into this world. Uh, the word becomes flesh. Why? So that on the cross, that flesh could be torn. And on that cross, the blood of Christ would be shed. So that he, the Son of God, would lay down his life as a sacrifice for our sin. Opening up the gift of life to the entire world. 
And on the third day, after having endured all of that, he rose from the dead so that today there is a living Savior to whom every one of us can come and receive the gift of life. The Son of Man will give life to you. That's what Jesus says. And the Son of Man is a reference to him. So Jesus gives eternal life. Jesus is eternal life. It follows that when Jesus becomes you, you yours, the eternal life that is in him and that he's ready to give to you then becomes yours. Are you with me? But how? Notice very clearly that Jesus doesn't belong to any of us by default. Well, I was raised in the church and I didn't commit any murders and, and you know, I deserve to have eternal life. No, 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 no. There's some stuff that you need to do. Verse 53, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have no life in you. This is so important. Jesus is making it very clear that there is something that you have to do. Eternal life is not yours because you came into Grace Community Church and breathed the air. It isn't yours by default. The word unless is key here. Unless this, unless you believe this life will not be in you. Ha Look again at verse 53. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. The flesh and blood Jesus clearly uh, refers to here is, is the sacrifice that he offered, the laying down of his life on the cross where his flesh was torn and his life was offered for the life of the world, where he stood in our place and suffered for the sins we committed. And he died for those sins on the cross. And Jesus describes the good of what he accomplished on the cross becoming Ours in terms of eating and feeding. Notice how he used the word, words eat, eats and feeds. In verse 54, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks on my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up on the last day. Or verse, verse 57, whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. Now, we're at a place where there's a crucial, crucial question. What then does it mean to eat or feed on the Lord Jesus Christ? It sounds pretty gruesome. And some Christians believe that these words of Jesus are about the Last Supper. Does this mean that we have eternal life by receiving communion? No. It seems very clear to me that Jesus isn't speaking about the Lord's Supper here. This, this is John chapter 6. The Lord's Supper is... Later on in John 13, and remember, Jesus is speaking here to people who had come across the wa in these water taxis, having been fed with, with bread that he had multiplied the, the previous day. These people had never heard of the Lord's Supper. And if Jesus was speaking about the Lord's Supper here, there's no way in the world that either they or the disciples could possibly have understood what Jesus was saying here. So what then does it mean to eat? And the answer is very simple. To eat is to believe. And if you look at this passage as a whole, you'll see that Jesus draws this parallelism, parallelism again and again and again. The food that endures to eternal life becomes yours. Verse 29, by believing. Jesus answered, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he has sent. The work of, that God requires, what God requires of us, has already been done. Jesus says, God sent his son into the world and all that God requires in order for you to have eternal life, that has been accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross. Are you with me? Jesus gives us eternal life. That's why it's not earned or merited. That's why he uses the word give. 
It's a free gift. He doesn't give you a list of certain things to do. You better do this, 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 and this, like, you know, your spouse might. If you do all that, then maybe I'll cook you dinner or something. I know. He, he doesn't give you a list of certain things to do. He doesn't say you do this and you earn your everlasting life. No, he's done all that he's needed to do when he died on the cross. And that's when eternal life becomes you, when you believe that. Not by adding another work to, to what Jesus has already done, but by believing in what Jesus has accomplished for you on the cross. The food that endures to eternal life comes to you by believing. Believing in Jesus who's been sent by the Father. Jesus repeats it not once but three times. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Whoever believes, it's a conviction. It's a conviction. And it's not a passing conviction. Verse 40, for this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life. Jesus is making it very clear right at the start of the passage, eternal life becomes ours by believing. And when he speaks about himself under the analogy of being the bread of life, he uses the analogy of eating in order to describe how he becomes ours by faith. Don't miss this. Jesus becomes ours by faith, by believing. The center of the Christian faith is Wow, friends, it's so wonderful. You study world religions and they're all like, yeah, we work, 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 work. And then maybe if you're good enough, ha, God will wink and let you in. The center of the Christian faith. It's awesome. It's not just simply a creed or a code of ethics. It's not a bunch of rules and regulations. At the very center of the Christian faith is a person, the glorious person of Jesus Christ who offers himself to us and has life in himself. And when by faith we become his, that life in him truly becomes ours. Can you say that? Maybe you've noticed as I have that there are a growing number of people who are interested in the whole question of spirituality there's a big market for people who want to cultivate inner peace and poise and tranquility. You just go to Sedona and suddenly you're, there's a world of exercises and therapies and crystals and chants and, and uh, marijuana and all kinds of stuff. And that's supposed to nourish your soul. But friends, we must remember that all of this is part of the life that in and of itself is passing away. And Jesus offers himself to you. And because he has life, eternal life in himself, when he becomes yours, this life that is in him becomes yours. And just as bread sustains the life of the body, Jesus Christ himself sustains to eternal life or to sustains, I shouldn't say to eternal life, sustains eternal life in your soul. He says, verse 57, whoever feeds on me will live because of me. Notice the tense feeds. This isn't whoever just once had a decision for believing long ago. He's saying that there is a living union that faith brings about in which your inner life is nourished by the very presence of the Son of God within you. And that's by the power, presence and power of the Holy Spirit. It's life transforming. And that, that this life that's begun in you because Jesus is in you is the guarantee that whatever your life in this world is, whenever it's done, it'll be slipping from here, not away, but into the presence of God and the infinite glories that lie ahead of you. And that'll be far better than, than the very best you've ever known on this earth. Now, here's the last thing that I want you to notice today. These words of Jesus will bring every one of us to a point of decision. That is, if we take them seriously. It's inevitable. 
And what you find here is that when Jesus spoke with this degree of clarity, directiveness, simplicity, authority, I give eternal life, eternal life is in me. If I am in you, you will have eternal life. Well, there's, there are two distinct and opposite reactions. Look at verse 60. When many of his disciples heard this, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to this? This guy's crazy. The, the, the necessity of, uh, of the death of Jesus in his crucifixion has always offended the world, and it always will, dear friends. And when, when they hear who Jesus is and what he's done and how he alone is able to offer his life and does so for, for all who will come and receive it, by faith from him. When they hear that plain and simple, they are offended by it. It's a hard saying. Never imagine that being offended uh, uh, at the gospel is just a 21st uh, century American problem. Actually, we're pretty good at being offended by every stinking thing that comes along. Ah, and then we've got to get all worked up and get in each other's grills. Ugh, it's just miserable. But it's universal. This is a universal reaction across all cultures and centuries. The uniqueness of Jesus Christ giving his life on the blood-soaked cross offends our world. It always has and it always will. And Jesus lost the crowd because of his teaching. And he let them go. And then he turns to his own, own disciples, verse 67. Do you want to go away as well? Verse 66. As many were offended by what he said said. In verse 60, we're told that many turned back and no longer walked with him. Verse 66, and Jesus says to the disciples, what about you? Are you going to go to? I mean, you're, you're living in a culture that is offended by the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. You're living in a, in a culture that is offended by the cross of Christ. What are you going to do? You're going to walk out this morning and go, ew, that preacher, he's Creepy talking about that stuff. Okay, I'll see you later. Maybe. What you gonna do? So the words of Jesus very clearly bring every single one of us to the point of decision and either you will turn from Jesus Christ, can't have anything to do with that, and eternal life will not be yours if you want, well, you'll be raised to eternal life if you want to call it that. It's just not a very pleasant place. Just turn up the heat in August about five trillion times, and that describes it. The other choice is to turn to Jesus Christ and receive him into your heart, to make him your savior. And the food that you have received into your heart. The bread of life will endure to eternal life. It will be in you, and you will live forever. Listen to these words of Jesus as we close. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger. Whoever believes in me will not thirst. Whoever feeds on me will live because of me. Amen. I love to bake bread. Anybody smell this during worship today? Was that cruel of me? I just want to remind you, friends, this is bread that will perish. And, 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 and I can promise you it's very tasty bread in order to eat it you have to kind of break it open i i was told that i i finished it too or i didn't uh, get it out in a timely way but this will perish it'll be gone tomorrow it won't be much good for eating the next day definitely won't be good for eating y'all are welcome to take a little piece of it before you leave today I'll put it over in the kitchen, but, oh, this is, this is good. 
But Jesus is so much better. Friends, I, I just, in fact, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to just take this down here. Michelle, you can come on up. I'm just going to set this down here. Yes, dear. She always takes care of me. Oh, thank you, honey. Party That's great. Like oh, shh. It's so good. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, the bread of life, who came to this earth for the sorry souls that we are, to redeem us, to restore us, to make us new. Thank you, Lord, that in Christ we have life and that abundantly. We have eternal life. May we receive him into our hearts this day if we have not already. And may we be reminded if we have accepted him into our hearts that this life is... <laughs> This life is fleeting, but life in Christ is forevermore. It's in, in his name that we pray. And let's stand. Just a reminder, if you're kind of newer and you'd like to have a different variation on bread, uh, pizza's coming in just a little while. Be here about 1130. We'd love to have you join us. And don't forget, we've got fellowship over here. Because life in that abundantly is a joyful thing, isn't it? And, and how joyless it would be if we didn't have each other. Thank God he's given us brothers and sisters in Christ. So don't forget, fellowship over in that area. And now receive these words, the words of Zephaniah the prophet. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Go therefore, dear friends, knowing that he's with you always. He will never leave you or forsake you. Why? Because you have eternal life. And it begins right now. It, it is right now. And Jesus has promised in the presence and power, by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, to empower you every day of your life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.